At this time, I'd like to introduce, actually, I, he really doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, Jim Crisp is one of the <coughs> folks that has, that's actually have been here all five years. He was a speaker the first year. Uh, he was an attendee the second year, and then he has been our moderator. This will be the third year. In perpetuity. In, in, now, he is in perpetuity, <laughs> right. And he, uh, uh, Jim, is, is, you know, is a professor at North Carolina State University. Um, he has just written a wonderful book, which some of you I know have already read, called Sleuthing the Alamo. <coughs> and um, some of the things that are in the book will be touched on today, particularly um, a woman by the name of Emily West. Um, since Jim, Jim, Jim is like family, so I'm not going to say, and here is Dr. Crisp. His mother calls him Jim Boy. So what I'm going to say is, here is Dr. Jim Boy. Thank you very much. And so many of us have been to all five of these that when I looked out there, the first phrase that came to mind was the usual suspects. Uh, and some of you know who you are. Uh, and I really appreciate seeing you at not only these five events, but so many others in Texas over the last many years. Um, I actually had to sign one of my books, Jim Boy Crisp, uh, for one of my high school classmates when I went back to Henrietta <coughs> in, uh, in February. And uh, for him, I'll do that. For, for you folks, you don't get that one. Um, I'm going to try to keep us on schedule by keeping my introductory remarks uh, uh, very, very short. Um, uh, in terms of the... Uh, of the whole session here and, and the sort of what some people have called a themeless meeting. We didn't assign, as we've done in past years, a general theme to this, <clears throat> to this entire symposium. But let me give you just a, a, a word of, of wisdom so that you can sound wise. The next time someone tells you anything about the Texas Revolution, no matter what they tell you, you just look at them like you know more than they do and say, it wasn't that simple. Uh, and you'll be exactly right. And they'll wonder what you know that they don't know. Uh, uh, all of the people today, uh, Jeff Dunn, uh, the, the wonderful Wall Ravens, uh, uh, Ed Miller and Caroline Krim are, are going to be talking about how the Texas Revolution just wasn't that simple. And um, as you listen to these talks today, uh, I think uh, Carolina Krim, Castillo Krim's uh, article is the uh, talk is the one which is the most obvious with these conflicting loyalties of the Tejanos. The Tejanos, more than anyone else, is, are obviously caught in a situation of conflicting loyalties. But you know, the complexities and the conflicting loyalties just keep emerging from the Texas Revolution the more I look at it and the more I watch the individuals um, having to deal with the chaotic situation of 1835-36. Even those people who had been plotting a Texas Revolution were in many ways caught off guard by the conflict that began in 1835. And so everyone is, uh, is improvising. Uh, I'll have some more theatrical allusions later on when I introduce Ed Miller. But just for now, I'll just say that there's a lot of, of, of improvisation going on in the Texas Revolution. And some of it is, uh, is actually funny, uh, like live at the improv. But uh, uh, some of it is tragic, obviously, too. Um, I have a minute to introduce Jeff Dunn. Uh, um, Jeff is, without any doubt, the best unpublished historian of the Texas Revolution. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have no hesitation in, in saying that. Um, if you want to know how I first ran into Jeff Dunn, uh, read Sleuthing the Alamo. It is on sale here. Uh, because Jeff and some of these other, some of the other people in this room, uh, are in uh, are in that book. Uh, but uh, every time I talk to Jeff uh, in person or on the phone or by email, I'm more impressed by the depth and accuracy of his knowledge of what's happening in the Texas Revolution. 
uh, uh, I'm not going to repeat the biographical information that's in your uh, that's in your program. You can read about where Jeff is and what Jeff has done. Uh, what's really uh, impressive about Jeff is not what Jeff has done, but what he's doing. Every time I meet him, every time I talk to him, he's doing something new and he's found something new and he's thought about something new uh, that enriches our knowledge of the Texas Revolution and that's what he's gonna do for you right now. Jeff. Well, thank you, Jim and Jan. And uh, on behalf of the <coughs> San Jacinto Historical Advisory Board, I also would like to uh, welcome everyone here to our fifth annual uh, San Jacinto Symposium, um, April 21st, 1836. Today, that day is called San Jacinto Day because of its importance in Texas history. And, and today we're here to learn more about that battle and some of the events that happened uh, during the period of the Texas Revolution. And in this session <clears throat> this morning, uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, some of the significant military maneuvers that happened uh, just before and including the battle uh, with a purpose in mind. How do we explain the fact that some 900 or so men under Sam Houston uh, who himself was a novice military commander at the time. Uh, this little ragtag army consisting of farmers, merchants, lawyers, doctors, men with practically no or very little military experience, how do we explain the fact that these men could overwhelm and defeat a Mexican army, a division of the Mexican army of 1,200 men under the command of fairly experienced officers uh, in less than 30 minutes and in a battle that's so lopsided, uh, it was considered almost miraculous by both sides. <clears throat> On the Texan side, it was a given that this battle was won because of the valor and bravery of the men who were fighting for a just cause. In their view, their just cause was liberty and independence from Mexico. Now, the Texans did disagree among themselves, and the eyewitness accounts following the battle demonstrate that there was a great deal of disagreement over who deserved the credit for the victory at San Jacinto. Did Sam Houston lead his men to victory after implementing a flawless and brilliant military strategy? Or was he compelled to fight against his better judgment uh, by his officers and men? And in the words of one historian brought to San Jacinto kicking and screaming. Well, the truth about Sam Houston really lies between these extremes, as it usually does in life. But <clears throat> an honest and careful analysis of the eyewitness accounts and looking at the credibility uh, <clears throat> and the motivations of the, <clears throat> of, the, of the people who wrote the memoirs during the 1830s, 40s, and 50s uh, does suggest that the weight of the evidence <clears throat> falls in favor of Sam Houston. That ultimately, when you look at his record and look at his personality, he was an exceptional man with exceptional talents. But that does not really adequately answer the question that I've posed, which is how really was this battle won? What was the decisive factor or factors that led to this victory or, or reversely the Mexican defeat? Uh, because on the Mexican side, you also had exceptional, exceptional people. Santa Ana, the commander of the Mexican army was himself uh, a, very, uh, a, a very good leader. Uh, militarily and politically. Uh, the Mexican soldiers also were brave. They fought with valor. And in their minds, they believed they were fighting for a very just cause, namely the preservation of Mexican sovereignty over Texas. So what did the Mexicans do after the Battle of San Jacinto? Well, they did something very similar to what the Texans did. Uh, only in this case, they started pointing the finger at each other and saying, it was your fault, no, it was your fault. Uh, on Santa Ana's perspective, <clears throat> he said the battle was lost, not because of anything he did, uh, but because his subordinates didn't follow his orders. Uh, his subordinates, those who survived the battle and wrote about the battle, said no, it was Santa Ana's fault. It was his mismanagement, his lack of foresight uh, that caused the defeat. Now, these were the issues that tended to get the most attention in the 19th century. Uh, but again, it doesn't necessarily explain what really happened at the battle and why the battle turned out the way it did. 
Um, and the question that I'm asking is, could there be other explanations for why the battle turned out the way it did? And I think there is, and I'm gonna tell you at least my theory about it today. The other thing I'm gonna talk about today is a story that has seemed to have captured the imagination about San Jacinto more than any other story, at least uh, dealing with this whole era. And that is uh, the story of what we call the Yellow Rose of Texas, um, which was never discussed publicly by any of the Texan or Mexican participants in the battle, uh, or for that matter, uh, any, anybody publicly in the 19th century. And that is the story of whether or not there really was a mixed race mulatto woman named Emily in Santa Ana's tent at the moment the battle started, and whether there was anything, any evidence to that story, and if so, uh, is there any credibility to that evidence? Okay. The first map I have here, and, and most by the way, all my maps <coughs> are uh, juxtaposed against a modern road map, uh, so that you can tell the road mark, it's, you can tell the landmarks today, and you can see where, where things are in relationship to the cities and towns today. Uh, the San Jacinto campaign was a very short campaign. It lasted less than 50 days. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do first is go through the mechanics of the battle, the campaign. These are, the things I'm telling you are largely accepted uh, and not, not in dispute, and I'll let you know if they are in dispute. Um, but it's important to have a, a good basic understanding of the maneuvers and what was happening uh, between uh, Gonzales, where the campaign started, and, and the battleground itself. Uh, Sam Houston was at Washington on the Brazos in early March, was part of the convention that declared independence for Texas, and it was during that time that the Alamo siege was, was occurring in San Antonio. And on March 6, uh, Houston left Washington on the Brazos and went to Gonzales. Let's see if I can get this to work. Gonzales is right there. Uh, he arrived there and he only found 374 men. Uh, this was supposed to be the group that was going to relieve the Alamo, uh, but two days later they, just, they find out that the Alamo has already fallen, so Sam Houston begins uh, his eastward movement, uh, which is often called a retreat in the accounts. Uh, his first line of defense was going to be the Colorado River, about where Columbus is located today. <clears throat> Uh, he arrived there, and the idea was to try to get Fannin's men, who were down at Goliad, uh, to link up with him on the Colorado River, so that the Colorado River would be the, the line of defense. Unfortunately, by the time Houston gets there, he learns that uh, a group of, of Mexicans has come uh, eastward following him. Uh, Fannin doesn't arrive because Urea's men in the south uh, catch up with Fannin before he has a chance to reach the Colorado, in fact, just only a few miles outside of Goliad. In the Battle of Caledo Creek on March 19th, Fannin surrenders. So that ends his participation in the war. Uh, Santa Ana's objective was, was a three-pronged objective. I show it on the map here. Uh, Guyona was to head north, ultimately to Nacogdoches, although he never made it uh, past uh, Bastrop. Uh, Santa Ana and Ramirez y Sesma was to take the center route, and Urea was to go a southern route along the coast. Now, once uh, Sam Houston learned about uh, Fannin's fate, he continued his retreat to the Brazos. And once he got to the Brazos, he reached the town of San Philippi. Uh, he left uh, Mulsey Baker's company on the opposite side of San Philippi, uh, Wally Martin's company down near Fort Bend, and there was a third company, uh, Ed, Edwin uh, Morehouse, who was located down in Columbia. We don't hear much about him because he never really made it uh, back and joined the Houston's army, but he was stationed with about 150 men down in Columbia. Uh, meanwhile, Houston turns north, and he arrives opposite the plantation of Jared Grossi, which is near present Hempstead, and remains there for almost two weeks. And it was during that time uh, that Tom Rusk joined the army. He was uh, Secretary of War uh, for the Texan cabinet. The cabinet, meantime, had broken up at Washington on the Brazos and had moved to Harrisburg. Santa Ana comes up to San Philippi. He can't cross over there because uh, Baker's men is uh, impeding the way. So he heads south to what's, what's called Fort Bend, sometimes Old Fort, near present-day Richmond. And when he gets there, he manages to uh, capture a boat and cross over and establish a beachhead on the other side. Uh, when he does this, uh, he finds out from a colonist 
that the Texan cabinet is located uh, very close by in Harrisburg, completely unprotected. And he uh, believes, and I think this was, uh, this was viewed as a brilliant strategy uh, among some of his Mexican officers, uh, that if he struck out ahead of his army and captured the cabinet, including Lorenzo de Zavala, who was the vice president at the time and, and a political enemy of his at one point, uh, that would almost uh, totally disconcert the Texas Rebellion and ended all at once. So that's what he did on April 14th. Let's see if I can get this to work. There it is. Uh, this is the situation on April 15th. Again, I'm superimposing this over a modern map of Houston. Uh, you need to remember at the time that in 1836, uh, this was one of the least populated areas of Texas. Texas had very few people to begin with, uh, but the only people that lived in, in what is now Harris County lived along uh, Buffalo Bayou, uh, Galveston Bay, a few settlements up San Jacinto River and Spring Creek and Cypress Creek, uh, all, all in, in said about certainly less than 1,000 people were living in what's now Harris County at the time. <clears throat> but Harrisburg was the center. And, and at Harrisburg, that's where the Texan capital was, uh, they got wind of the fact that Santa Ana was coming up uh, toward them. Uh, they get on the steamboat Cayuga, and this blue line here shows the route that they took. They went on out and went down to Galveston. That was going to be their, their point of safety. Meanwhile, Santa Ana arrives at Harrisburg late at night on April 15th, uh, discovers uh, three men in the printing shop there, uh, and they tell him that Sam Houston is way up at uh, Grossi's plantation is retreating to the Trinity. You don't have to worry about him. Uh, Santa Ana <coughs> the, decides at that point that uh, he wants to try to head off the Texan cabinet and try to capture them before they reach Galveston. Uh, so what he does is he sends his cavalry. Uh, at this point, uh, Santa Ana has 700 infantry, 50 cavalrymen, and one cannon with him. So he sends his cavalry with, uh, under the command of Colonel Almonte to Lynch's Ferry. Uh, to try to hit them off. Lynch's Ferry is right about there. Now, meanwhile, Houston learns of uh, this movement. Let me see if I can. Oops. This is Harrisburg today. Uh, a little hard to see, but there's a little triangular marker. And unfortunately, this marker is, uh, is in a lot that's not used uh, as a parking lot for garbage trucks. Uh, and it's very unfortunate that this uh, very historic site uh, is uh, dilapidated to this extent. Uh, this, this marker is a uh, marker that was placed by the Daughters of the Republic of Texas in 1928 and uh, right on the site of where Mrs. Jane Harris's house was, uh, which was, which was used at that time for the short period of time that they were in Harrisburg as the, uh, as the capital. And here's a shot looking toward Buffalo Bio. This is actually a little branch of the ship channel, but uh, it's uh, one of the original, uh, original bed of Buffalo Bio. And of course, it's right in the middle of the uh, industrial area. <clears throat> On April 16th, Santa Ana changes his plans. Originally, he was going to uh, only make a three-day foray and come back. Uh, but at this time, uh, as I mentioned before, he sends uh, Almonte over to Lynch's Ferry right here. And uh, he also decides to send orders back to his, uh, sec his, his commander, uh, General Coase, uh, who uh, was a subordinate officer still at Fort Bend. Uh, when he left Fort Bend, he told Coase, I want you to take 500 men to Velasco, which is where Surfside Beach is today, and take that important uh, port. Uh, but what he did on April 16th was he sent his uh, officer, Miguel Bachir, uh, back to Fort Bend uh, with orders to General Coast to change, his or to change his plans. And the plans were, instead of taking 500 men to Velasco, I want you to take 200 men to Velasco. On April 17th, uh, Sam Houston is now coming down through uh, northwest Harris County. You can see it on the map, the blue line. <coughs> And uh, Santa Ana uh, decides that, uh, uh, well, what happens uh, at, on this day is uh, Almonte reaches Lynch's Ferry uh, and tries to do the same thing that he did uh, back at Fort Bend on the Brazos, which was try to capture a boat and cross over. Uh, he, he fails to do so, although uh, there's a story about Mrs. Lynch being on the opposite side uh, and hearing Almonte in perfect English calling over, please give me your boat. And she, and she refusing to do so. So may, maybe we owe the entire battle to her refusal uh, to give him the boat. In any event, he gets frustrated and, and, and uh, rides down to New Washington 
uh, which was the only part of Harris County at that time, present Harris County, that was still occupied by the Texans, uh, surprises uh, the uh, servants of James Morgan. That was his, his headquarters at New Washington. Uh, President David G. Burnett was there with his family, his wife, two young children. Uh, they are able to scramble out on a small little skiff, uh, literally moments before uh, the Mexican cavalry arrives. Uh, there's a famous incident of uh, Burnett saying, well, I'll stand up and take the first shot and opening up his, his shirt uh, in order to uh, show his bravery. Uh, and he does eventually make it safely down to, to, uh, to, to Galveston. Meanwhile, Amante finds all this great stuff. He finds food and provisions, sends word, word back to uh, Santa Ana uh, that he's captured all of, this, uh, all of this stuff, and Santa Ana decides that he wants to go secure it himself. So he leaves uh, Harrisburg on the 17th and starts heading toward New Washington. In the meantime, he changes his orders again for, gen uh, for coasts. Uh, this time, he sends his aide, uh, Castillo E. E. Berry, back to Fort Bend and says, I want to change Costa's orders again. Instead of sending him down to Velasco with 200 men, I want him to take 500 men to me. So this, this is the order that was taken on, on April 17th. And it appears that his plans at this point were that he was going to secure New Washington, uh, cross at Lynch's Ferry eventually, and, and head over either to Anahuac or, uh, or Galveston. Now, in the meantime, as I mentioned up here in the top of the, of the page, you can see Sam Houston's route coming through there. Uh, when Sam Houston heard about uh, Santa Ana leaving Fort Bend, uh, <clears throat> there was, uh, he immediately crossed over the Brazos on the steamboat Yellowstone. And uh, he, uh, there, there was, a, uh, and then of course made this forced march uh, in two and a half days up to uh, opposite Harrisburg. Uh, there was a great deal of controversy about whether or not Houston really wanted to go to Nacogdoches or some other place instead of Harrisburg. And this is, this is a common theme that you see throughout the accounts. And uh, there, uh, there are no dispatches, there are no official orders or dispatches that, that really give us any definitive conclusions on this. Uh, but there is uh, a couple of famous anecdotes or incidences that happen along the way <clears throat> that suggest that, uh, that his detractors used to suggest that he was really uh, forced to go in this direction. And the most famous is the incident of Mrs. Mann and her oxen. The story is that she lent him uh, her oxen uh, at Grossi's plantation with the intention of uh, going to, uh, taking the Nacogdoches Road. And when he veered off that road at Abraham Roberts' house uh, in North, uh, North, uh, what's now North Harris County, uh, uh, she contended that uh, he misrepresented himself to her. And so she demanded back her oxen uh, at the point of a gun, and, <clears throat> and the uh, soldiers uh, were unable to to, uh, to get the oxen back. Uh, now, the, the story really is more about her, I think, than about Sam Houston, uh, because it does illustrate that she, she had a, a very peppery personality, to say the least, and got in trouble with the law uh, several times uh, in the 1840s or so. Uh, but the, but the, there are a couple of facts that are interesting here that, that, are, that historians often overlook. Uh, the first is that if Houston had intended to move to Nacogdoches, uh, he would have taken the road from Donahoe's house, which was the first stop after crossing the Brazos River. And that, that had, had been long past by the time they got to the fork in the road at Abraham Roberts. So it seems to me that if Houston really did intend to go to Nacogdoches, it would have happened long before the fork in the road was reached at Abraham Roberts. Uh, the second thing is that no one knew at the time whether there really would be a fight by heading toward Harrisburg. Uh, a lot of the eyewitness accounts said, we want to go to Harrisburg because that's where the fight's going to be. But they didn't know that. Uh, they could, the fight could just as easily have been up in Nacogdoches. And in fact, we know, as I showed you on the first map, uh, uh, Guyana was heading mm -hmm. toward Nacogdoches. And the battle could easily have just as been up there than it could have been in Harris County. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> uh, as, we, as I just uh, told you about uh, Almonte trying to cross at Lynch's Ferry, uh, even under the existing circumstances, even if they knew that, uh, that, there, that Santa Ana was in this direction and there would be a fight, the chances were that very easily that uh, they could have crossed at Lynch's Ferry and had the Mexican army done that, uh, Houston would have found himself really in a bad situation, totally behind the Mexican uh, advance uh, with the river separating them. So <clears throat> uh, nobody in the army really knew what was going to happen as they were hitting uh, south uh, toward, toward Harrisburg on April 17th. This is Morgan's Point today, <clears throat> and uh, 
I always find it interesting that, uh, look at that little <coughs> yellow rose up there the, on the sign. Uh, <coughs> this is where uh, Almonte was, uh, and Santa Ana arrived there on April 18th. And uh, it's interesting that he's just lingered there for several days. Uh, he had plenty of opportunities at that point to cross over to the other side, but he stayed there in New Washington. Here's another shot of uh, the edge of Morgan's Point, which is now right on the ship channel. If you look in the maps of uh, the 1830s, it's a, it's a long uh, peninsula that heads out into San Jacinto Bay. It separates the San Jacinto River from, uh, from Galveston Bay, uh, but the uh, ship channel sliced right through it, so it's a truncated uh, peninsula today. April 18th. Santa Ana is now at New Washington. Uh, Sam Houston arrives opposite Harrisburg. He sends out his scouts, Def Smith, Henry Carnes, to see what's going on. He sees that Harrisburg has been burned. As Santa Ana left, Harrisburg burned it. Def Smith heads out toward Fort Bend, and lo and behold, he encounters Miguel Bachir. He's the captain who took Santa Ana's message on April 16th. Well, now he's coming back. He's coming back because General Feely Sola, who is second in command, at Fort Bend, decided to uh, let Santa Ana know that he received the orders about General Coase, and uh, also a courier who just arrived from Mexico City uh, with a bushel of letters congratulating Santa Ana on his victory at the Alamo. Uh, so the two of them, and a guide from San Antonio, who also happened to be uh, a former member of Juan Seguin's company, uh, the three of them were uh, uh, riding toward Harrisburg and encounter uh, Def Smith, and Def Smith captures them. Uh, Jeff Smith thinks this is so great that he forces a McGillier to change clothes with him. And so as a practical joke, uh, he rides back with a, a Mexican uniform on and Miguel Bajir is wearing the buckskins of Jeff Smith. Uh, they arrive opposite Harrisburg and, um, <coughs> uh, and although everybody thought that was funny, the, the reality was <coughs> is that this was a tremendous amount of uh, military intelligence because uh, for the first time, uh, Houston now realizes that Santa Ana is, in fact, personally with the Army. They didn't know that up until that day. Uh, he also learns that Santa Ana has split his forces uh, and that the force at New Washington is much smaller than the force Houston had. Uh, he also learns that Santa Ana was intending to head toward Lynch's Ferry uh, with the intention of, of crossing, and that, and that coast was on his way, and that he would be arriving in a couple of days. So April 19th, Houston decides we're going to cross over and try to hit them off of the pass, so to speak. Uh, at this point, it almost becomes a race to see who can get to Lynch's Ferry first. Uh, Houston and Tom Russ gave rousing speeches to their men in the morning, and that's when the phrase, remember the Alamo, was first coined and expressed. Uh, they spend most of the day crossing over Buffalo Bayou uh, and uh, marching toward uh, Lynch's Ferry. <coughs> On the 20th, uh, as Houston's army gets closer to Lynch's Ferry, the first of several clashes between the Mexican and Texan army occurs, and this happened near James Roos House, uh, which is uh, between uh, Laporte and the battleground, where, where uh, scouts uh, on, of Houston's army and scouts of Santa Ana's army uh, clashed. Uh, not much uh, happened, it was a very short incident, but what it did show was that uh, it, did, it did indicate to Houston uh, that the Mexicans were coming up, and it, it, it did indicate to Santa Ana that, uh, that there was a force of Texans on the way to Lynch's Ferry, and it hurried up his forces. Meanwhile, uh, this dotted line that you see here across the page, this dotted line is General Coase coming on. He is literally almost right behind Sam Houston's army as he's uh, coming up, so Sam Houston is almost in between the two forces. But it turns out Houston arrives at Lynch's Ferry first. This is a shot at Lynch's Ferry today. Uh, when uh, Houston gets here, the first thing that they find is a flatboat filled with provisions. Um, and they capture that, and uh, they uh, are able to use that to, to make some bread, which is important. Um, the, the role of food during this campaign has not really been studied very extensively, uh, but a, a hungry soldier is not a very good soldier and a well-fed soldier tends to fight better. And it just turned out that this boatload of flour that was coming up from New Washington, which was supposed to supply the Mexican army, which is now in Texan hands, 
uh, helped uh, fortify uh, the well-being of the, of the Texas Army on April 20th. Now, as, as Santa Ana marches up, uh, he, uh, one thing I need to mention about uh, New Washington and uh, what is today called Morgan's Point uh, is uh, that area was settled by James Morgan in 1834 and had three buildings there. Uh, one of them was, uh, had lots of furniture in it, and just before uh, Santa Ana left, uh, he decided he was going to destroy all of this and piled all the furniture up in one corner of the room uh, took uh, these large casks of liquor, knocked the heads of the casks off, and he personally set fire to, to New Washington before heading up to Lynch's Ferry. Now, Houston found that uh, Lynch's Ferry was not a very good place to defend himself, so he backtracked a little bit, <coughs> reaching what's now the battleground. And this is the view from the Texan camp at the battleground looking toward the monument. And this was the situation where uh, he was in on the morning of April 20th. And here's a shot looking in the other direction. In 1836, the, the tree cover was uh, ex much more extensive, and it was almost like a natural boundary. Uh, you have to remember that in 1836, because all of this area of Texas is flat, uh, the only means of defense was really to get behind a tree or to, to have, a, have a river in front of you. So the, the waterways and the trees were extremely important in the defensive maneuvers that were going on at the time. Now, morning of April 20th, I'm superimposing this over a modern map, so just ignore the fact that the battleship Texas is up there on the left there. <laughs> the Texans line up, and those of you who are familiar with the, uh, with the way the Texans uh, fought at the Battle of San Jacinto, you may be interested in knowing that they, they were not lined up uh, the same way on April 20th. They, they lined up a little bit differently. On the left side, the second regiment, which was Sherman's regiment, was actually commanded that day by uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Bennett, who was the second in command. Uh, in the center, you had the twin sisters, the two cannon, and these two cannon came from Cincinnati and met the Texas Army uh, as they crossed uh, at Grossi's and, and hauled them back to here. Uh, they're fairly small cannon. Uh, they were under the command of uh, Colonel, Colonel James Neal. Uh, behind the twin sisters was the regiment of uh, Henry Millard. Uh, and he is uh, often called the, his, his men are called the regulars because they had muskets and uh, were enlisted men. But he also had two companies of volunteers with them as well. And behind him was the cavalry. And, and on this day, the cavalry was, uh, was under the command of Sherman. And that's why Sherman was not in command of his regiment. And to the very right, on the, on the far right, was uh, Burleson's first regiment of volunteers. They line up and up comes Santa Ana's men. You see them coming up uh, here to the right side. And they reached uh, about where the San Jacinto Monument is today. Uh, and they were under the cover of two, uh, what they call islands of trees. One on the right, one on the left. And they, they placed their single cannon over here on the one on the right. And uh, the first thing that happened was Santa Ana sees that there is some activity along the trees, uh, fires off uh, some artillery fire, uh, and the Texans uh, respond with their own artillery, which somewhat startles the Mexicans because they didn't realize that the Texans had artillery. And artillery was a very important weapon in those days because they used what's called canister. And when those things shot out, it was like a shotgun effect and it had a very deadly effect. Also, it made a lot of noise. And when, when it makes a lot of noise, it tends to scare people. April 20th, the evening. So during the day, the cannon was uh, playing against each other, uh, and uh, Santa Ana decides to move back. He moves back to what's now the Mexican camp area on the battleground, which is back in here. Uh, but for some strange reason, he leaves his cannon exposed. Again, you can see the cannon right here, uh, just off to the side of where the monument is today. Uh, Pedro Delgado, one of his officers, was in charge of that cannon, and, f and he was one of the very few Mexican officers who survived the battle and, and also wrote about it. And he wrote about the fact that he was almost abandoned there, right in the middle of the situation. Uh, he had 50 ammunition boxes, and they came with, uh, they were hauled over there with mules. But Santa Ana not only uh, withdrew his forces, but also took all the mules away and told uh, Delgado that somehow or other he had to defend for himself and get all those 
boxes and, and the, the cannon back to his main lines. And Delgado's saying, wait a minute, you've got me totally exposed here. Uh, we could be killed. And uh, he, he's clearly worried about it. And sure enough, the Texans uh, see this situation as an opportunity. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the, the credit goes to Sidney Sherman, the commander of the cavalry, he goes to Sam Houston and says, I think if we run out there, we might be able to capture that cannon or, or at least see what's going on. And uh, Houston says, okay, you can do that. Uh, but what ensues at this point is one of the most controversial events of the entire campaign. And it's, uh, it will take an entire session of our symposium to really go through this because this is the start of, the, of a feud that, that began between Sherman and Houston uh, that lasted uh, uh, for, for their lives and for three or four generations after that. <laughs> Maybe even more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is that the, uh, the story is that uh, Sam Houston said, you can go out there, but I want, only want you to reconnoiter. I only want you to look around and uh, see what's going on and come back and tell me the situation. Because at this time, it was very late in the day. It was almost 5 PM late in the day. And S Sam Houston did not want to bring on a fight. Uh, but he did say, look, if you go out there and you get in trouble, I've got my large regiment lined up, and he'll come out and support you uh, if there's a problem. Sherman's side of the story was that he was to go out there and try to capture that cannon. And when, if the Mexicans attacked him, he was to be supported by Millard's men. So Sherman goes out there with his cavalry. And, oops, let me get back here. And, uh, he, he, and it's just about the time he gets back that Delgado's managing to get that cannon back to, to the lines. Uh, and then out comes a couple of riflemen, uh, rifle uh, units uh, from the Mexican Army to, and also some cavalry to meet Sherman's cavalry, and they have a skirmish on April 20th. There's, a, there's one marker on the battleground that identifies the site of this skirmish. Um, and uh, Sherman gets beat up pretty badly. Uh, he, holds, he fends himself pretty well, uh, and of course he's looking out the side of his, uh, you know, one of his uh, eyes saying, well, where, where, where are the men supposed to support me? They're supposed to be here, and they weren't there. So he, he heads back to, to the Texan lines. Um, and of course, he always thought that Sam Houston was trying to get him killed, you know, which is probably not really true. But, but uh, that was one of the things. And I, just as an anecdote here, uh, you know, the, the, many of the descendants uh, still uh, were upset about this. And, and one of them, uh, Clarence Kendall, who's relation to the famous Kendall family, uh, that's reputed, I don't know this for sure, but it's been recorded that in 1960, he gave an hour's oration at the battle uh, on San Jacinto Day, a complete narration of the battle, and not once mentioned Sam Houston's name. So. <laughs> so, evening of April 20th, uh, Santa Ana moves back to his lines and uh, attempts some measure of fortification. Uh, the fortification consisted of nothing more than pack saddles and branches of trees in front of him, uh, and the Texans, of course, go back to their lines and wait till the morning. 21st. Now, this is an overview of the 21st because uh, lots of things happen on this day. Uh, and what, what we show here is that when, Sam, when Houston left uh, uh, Buffalo Bow, he did leave a camp guard uh, under uh, 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 Captain McNutt. And that camp guard consisted of about 300 men. Some of them were sick. Some of them were not really effective. Uh, but, but Coase also comes up that day. Coase uh, finally reaches Santa Ana's men. And instead of bringing 500 men, he brings 400 men. And the reason he brought 400 men is because when he got to Sims Bio, let me back this up here. When he got to Sims Bio, uh, the bio was too hard to cross. He had too much baggage with him. So he left uh, uh, Colonel uh, Mariano Garcia there with 100 men. And uh, in, a, in a very little known incident that happened on April 21st, uh, these guys at the camp guard went down and attacked the Garcia uh, contingency and uh, apparently even killed one of the men. Uh, but that's a little known incident that happened uh, with the camp guard over on Buffalo Bio. In the meantime, uh, the little blue dotted line that I show you on the map is the route that Def Smith took. Uh, Sam Houston ordered Def Smith over to Vince's Bridge, which is over Vince's Bio, incidentally, uh, to uh, destroy the bridge and uh, come back to, uh, to the battleground. There. Okay, this is the situation on the morning of April 21st. <clears throat> the Texans are now organized a little bit differently. Uh, you have Sherman is now over, taking over his own regiment 
uh, because during the cavalry skirmish, uh, Maribel Lamar distinguished himself extensively, and although he didn't have an officer's position that day, uh, the men decided they really wanted him to command the cavalry. Um, and even though this big feud happened with Sherman and Houston, uh, that didn't come out into the public arena until many years later. Uh, the, the report of the battle uh, did not mention anything at all about any kind of disagreement. Uh, so the fact that Sherman was going back and taking over his own regiment doesn't look at all unusual uh, to any, any observer here. Uh, also, on the, so on the left, you had Sherman's regiment, then you had Burleson's uh, first regiment of volunteers. Uh, Colonel Neal was wounded uh, during the artillery duel the first day, so uh, Hockley takes over the artillery. Uh, Millard with his regulars and volunteers, and finally on the right is uh, Lamar's cavalry. And you see over to the uh, left side of the, of the map, uh, General uh, Coast uh, arriving, and the names of the different battalions or regiments that were at San Jacinto that day. And now the battle. What, was the, what were the Texans going to do that day? Well, around noon, Santa Ana re does his own little reconnoitering. He rides out and sees that, <coughs> uh, that there's very little activity going on in the Texan camp, and that was true. Uh, he felt that that because the Texans were unlikely to attack him that day, and because uh, Coast had arrived uh, exhausted after having a long march, that he was going to let his men rest that day in preparation for an attack the following day. Meanwhile, there was great uncertainty in the Texan camp. What were they going to do? Uh, should they wait for Santa Ana to attack them, or should they take the offensive and attack Santa Ana? Uh, well, that answer uh, at noon on April 21st was not so obvious. Um, and it, it, for the first time during this entire campaign, a number of uh, officers came to Sam Houston and said, we, we just need to talk about this. We need to have a council of war. Uh, so Sam Houston says, fine, let's have a council of war. Uh, they show up, uh, they discuss the situation, and decide overwhelmingly that it would be insane to cross this field and attack Santa Ana's position. Uh, in the open day, and that they were much better off uh, waiting in the trees where they were and awaiting Santa Ana's attack, that that would be the most sensible thing to do. Uh, only two officers said, well, let's just go over there and attack them. Uh, the overwhelming majority of them uh, said, no, let's wait here. Uh, Houston uh, reportedly said nothing, uh, <clears throat> but he, he was a cautious man, and he, did, he wanted to make sure that whatever happened, uh, that he had the... Uh, that he had the men on his side. He wanted to make sure that this was a decision that everybody wanted to do. And so he was not pressing the issue to attack at noon. <clears throat> but as the hours passed, they realized that the Mexican army was not going to attack that day. Um, they also were worried because of Costa's reinforcements that there could be other reinforcements on the way. And that would make the Mexican army even bigger than his. At this point with Coast there, Coast uh, Santa Ana now outnumbered uh, Houston. Um, but there still was some more quandaries because Houston also knew that there were reinforcements on the way to him. Uh, he had sent couriers down to Galveston, and there were two boats coming up from Galveston to reinforce him. And in fact, they got to the battleground a few days after the battle. Uh, there also was a company of uh, volunteers coming down from Nacogdoches. So should he wait uh, and perhaps wait till he gets those reinforcements? These are all things weighing on their minds, and as Jim Chris mentioned, uh, you know, this, these incidences, these battle, this battle is not quite so simple. It's a fairly complex thing on both sides. But in the afternoon, the eyewitness, eyewitness account suggests that what Sam Houston did was he went around and talked to his men, tried to get the feeling, tried to get their, uh, uh, what, what, were they really, what were they really thinking at the time, and what did they really want to do, and he got the impression that they were really anxious to fight. Uh, that comes through loud and clear in a lot of the eyewitness accounts, but of course those are after the fact, after they've won. You know, what you really have to do is think about what was happening at the time and not try to think about the Monday morning quarterbacking. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's apparent that he felt that this was a good time to do it. It was late in the afternoon, um, and the officers uh, then conferred among the men in their various regiments, and it came back to Houston, everybody's ready to go. So about <clears throat> Uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Within 15 minutes, uh, the Texans line up and they march over. Uh, you have the cavalry on the left and the uh, regiments, the infantry units along the left and the cavalry on the right. And 
it was about this time that Jeff Smith came back after uh, uh, burning uh, Vince's bridge. And as they uh, marched over, uh, within about 300 yards of the Mexican army, the Mexicans see them and they start firing. They have what's called escopetas, or muskets, English-made muskets, which are, uh, uh, I think, were lousy shots. <laughs> they, 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 were not, they could not aim them very carefully. Uh, the story is that you cannot take them like a rifle and hold them up to your eyes and aim. You had to either hold them over your head or by your hip and shoot and just hope it hits your target. Uh, they also shot their, so they were not good shots. All the shots were going over the Texans' head, but they were seeing the Texans coming. That's the important thing. Uh, secondly, uh, they were shooting off their cannon. Now that cannon was, was nasty because it had canister as the Texans did. And as, the, as they, they could see the flash of the, uh, of the, of the fire of the cannon before it actually uh, ex it exploded, and when they saw that, the Texans were, were, they dropped down on the ground in the high grass to avoid uh, getting hit. And all the shrapnel comes over their heads. Uh, then they get up and they continue to walk forward. And there's a funny story about uh, uh, one of these soldiers, uh, Bob Love, who apparently didn't hear the order to fall down when you see the flash of the cannon. And so when the first flash happened and the cannon went off, everybody falls down but him. He gets scared, runs back to the camp where there's about 30 men there at the camp saying, run for your lives. Everybody's been killed but me. <laughs> <laughs> That's been documented at least in two occasions. <laughs> now, meanwhile, the Texans do not fire. They march up, and if you, if you go to the battlefield today, this is the, the lone marker, the Houston wounded and horse killed under him during battle. He's looking out, the Mexican lines are in front of you. And the Texans get to about 70 yards after being under foul, fire for about 15 or 20 minutes. And with Sam Houston riding between the lines, uh, he gives uh, the men uh, the, the order that changes the entire complexion of the battle. And it consisted only of one word, uh, which is uh, coincidentally uh, visualized on your uh, program, which is charge. Uh, instead of stopping to reload, uh, which was a very difficult and time-consuming task with these flintlock rifles that the Texans had, they had better rifles, better ammunition, <clears throat> they, uh, rushed the t they rushed the Mexican lines uh, using their guns as clubs and knives. And uh, Sherman's men hit the uh, left line first, the cavalry then hit the uh, Mexican uh, left next, and then Burleson and Millard had a little trouble getting the center because there was resistance there, but they eventually took over the center and took over the cannon, and uh, in less than 30 minutes, uh, the battle was over with. Um, uh, there is uh, an interesting account by Ramon Caro, who was Santa Ana's secretary, who uh, describes the scene. Uh, he says that the horrible memory of that moment makes the pen drop from my hand for a few minutes. Imagine our being surprised at four in the afternoon in the middle of an open plain with nothing to obstruct the view of the enemy from our front. They succeeded in advancing to within 200 yards from our works without being discovered, and from there they spread death and terror among our ranks. Once it got to that point, it didn't become a battle anymore. It became a rout, and the Texans were totally disorganized every man fighting for himself, which was an extremely dangerous situation for the Texans to be in. Uh, Houston knew this, many of his officers knew this, because if Feely Sola had been sending reinforcements, uh, the Texans would have been in extremely bad shape at that time because they were breaking their guns, uh, they were not in order. Uh, but as it turned out, there were no Mexican reinforcements, and for several hours, uh, there was a lot of death and destruction, uh, totally one-sided. Uh, there is a, an account by uh, J. Hazard Perry, uh, which has rec only recently come to light. It was mentioned in the Dallas Morning News only a few weeks ago. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that uh, he said, he describes the scene uh, fairly graphically uh, in, in a speech in 1842 in New York. He says that he saw much cruelty perpetrated by the Texans upon their enemy that day. And at one time, some 400 Mexicans were enclosed by the army. They threw down their arms, knelt, and begged for their lives. The Texans who first came up were disposed to spare them, stopping to cleanse their rifles. But the main body soon came up and at once rushed upon them, beating their brains out with their rifles and tomahawks. 
The officers could not control their men, and when the cry, remember the Alamo, was raised, the fury of the Texans was beyond restraint. The battlefield was covered with tall grass, and many of the wounded Mexicans had concealed themselves in this. There being a high wind, <clears throat> there being a high wind, some of the Texans set fire to the grass and then shot at the wounded wretches as they came crawling out. Colonel Perry said that he saw sometimes six or seven men firing a single at a single man. Now, it's important to know, though, that this mayhem was not motivated by any racial prejudice or hatred. Uh, and, you know, that's, that is something that's very important to, to, uh, to recognize here uh, because uh, that was not part of what they were fighting for or what the Mexicans were defending themselves against. In fact, there's one remarkable account that refers to an incident involving one of Juan Seguin's men, which illustrates that even they had this zeal. And this comes from Walter Lane's uh, uh, account. He says that during the fight, a Mexican officer found himself at the very muzzle of a rifle in the hands of one of our men. He begged for mercy and happened at that moment to see a Mexican who was in our ranks, whose name was Menchaca, whom he had known <clears throat> for many years at Bejar. He bellowed out to Menchaca, calling him a brother Mexican, and invoked him to save his life. Menchaca replied, quote, no, damn you, I'm no Mexican. I'm an American. Shoot him. And the soldier fired and killed him. So it was bad. This is the back part of the battlefield. Uh, many people think that uh, they refer to the fact that uh, Peggy's Lake was where a lot of the carnage was, but actually there was a little boggy bio between Santa Ana's camp and Peggy's Lake. And if Santa Ana had only uh, situated his troops on the opposite side, the south side of this boggy bio, I think the battle would not have turned out the way it did because it would have impeded the Texans' march. Uh, but he didn't do that. And this little boggy bio, which today looks more like a lagoon, is where most of the death and destruction occurred. And this is also where uh, Almonte was finally uh, surrendered uh, at the end of the day toward dusk and the battle was over with Santa Ana being captured uh, the next day. Now, that ends the narrative of the battle. Uh, what were Santa Ana's excuses? Well, he said, first of all, Coast came up with raw recruits instead of chosen troops. In other words, he felt like Coast disobeyed orders because he didn't bring the right troops. Coast carried too much baggage with him, and as a result of that, 100 men had to stay behind at Sims Bio and couldn't make it. <clears throat> that was another excuse. He blamed the capture of Miguel Bachir, the courier, on April 18th, uh, which was a good excuse because that did give Houston the incentive, and that's why Houston marched over to Lynch's Ferry. He said he ordered close vigilance of the, of the enemy, but Castrillon didn't do it. He disobeyed orders, his, his general, who was supposed to be, uh, be in charge of that. Now, the problem is, is Castrillon was killed during the battle, so he can't defend himself uh, <clears throat> to, to talk about whether that was legitimate or not. And there's also an interesting account that uh, he and Santa Ana had a very bad argument uh, on April 21st, just before the battle. So they may not have even been speaking to each other uh, by the time the battle had started. Uh, he also admits that he was overconfident and suggests that, uh, that the overconfidence may have uh, uh, thrown throw him a little bit off guard. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, but I think that the real reason that this happened goes back to that one word charge because when that charge happened, that, that was the surprise of San Jacinto. It wasn't, the, su the surprise of San Jacinto wasn't that they were caught completely unaware that the Texans were coming. Because as I mentioned before, the Mexicans were firing on them for quite some time before the Texans actually got up to them. And so they had time to prepare for this attack. But what they weren't able to prepare for was the fact that the Texans didn't stop and reload and fire again. Instead, once they fired and fired once or twice, they charged them, they ran up against them. The Texans were, they had what's called Elon, which is uh, spirit, high morale. Uh, remember the Alamo was electrifying. Uh, they, uh, they were physically bigger, so in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, it was easier for the Texans to overwhelm them. Uh, it, it, it caused a panic among the Mexican lines, and once the panic starts in a group like that, it's hard to get for the Mexican officers to get control. The Mexicans did the best they could under the circumstance but that was a very unusual maneuver for anybody in the 19th century to do, was to actually charge the camp. And it was extremely risky, as I mentioned, because if reinforcements had come along, the Texans would have been in bad shape. So I think that the real surprise of San Jacinto was the change in tactics right at the moment of the, of the, that the significant part of the battle started. Now, what about 
the other reason. What about Emily D. West and the Yellow Rose of Texas? Is there any substance to that? I've only got a few more minutes left, and I want to go through that. <clears throat> the first thing I want to ask you to do is wipe your mind clean of everything you've heard about the Yellow Rose of Texas and Emily West, because most of it is probably incorrect. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this story comes from one source and one source only. It comes from a journal of an Englishman named William Bollard who came to the town of Houston in 1842. <clears throat> and coincidentally, the very day that he is visiting with Sam Houston, he writes in his journal, the following is a copy of an unpublished letter written by General Houston to a friend after this extraordinary battle. He's referring to the battle. <clears throat> And he says, the Battle of San Jacinto was probably lost to the Mexicans, owing to the influence of a mulatto girl, Emily, belonging to Colonel Morgan, who was closeted in the tent with General Santa Ana at the time the cry was made, the enemy, they come, they come, and detained Santa Ana so long that order could not be restored readily again. That's it. That's the sole account. There's nothing in here about her age, uh, her, her, uh, what she looked like, uh, and, or nothing else. Um, we never would have even known about this journal except for the fact that it ended up at Newberry Library in Chicago in 1912, and historians knew about it for decades, but the story was never published until the 1950s. <clears throat> and uh, it wasn't until Jim Letzwalder, Jim Crist, a graduate student, did the forensic work that the reference to, General, to Sam Houston was really associated with this account. Uh, but it's important to emphasize that, that this story was not, it's not known whether this story was generally talked about in the 19th century uh, because nobody on the Texan or Mexican side ever wrote about it. There's no e even manuscript letters that refer to the story that indicate that there was a, even a rumor going around of this, of this account. So the question is, is this credible? Uh, could, is this a believable account? Let me point this out. This is a copy of the actual diary. You can see here, in the, the very top part is where it mentions Emily. <clears throat> well, uh, we have uh, some corroborating evidence uh, in, in uh, passport records in the state archives. And, uh, you know, when Woodward and Bernstein did their report on the, on the Watergates, uh, they always would, uh, they would never publish anything unless they had two sources to back it up. Uh, we only have one source for this story, but we do have two documents that shed some additional light on who this Emily was that belonged to Colonel Morgan. And one of them is this passport record, which was discovered, so to speak, and related to the story in the 1970s. Uh, and this <coughs> account says uh, that the bearer of this, Emily D. West, has been since my first acquaintance with her in April of 36, a free woman. She emigrated to this country with Colonel James Morgan from the state of New York in September of 35 and is now anxious to return and wishes a passport. I believe myself that she is entitled to one and has requested me to give her this note to you, your obedient servant, I. N. Moreland. Her free papers were lost at San Jacinto, as I am informed and believe in April of 36, Moreland. Moreland was, was part of the artillery company at San Jacinto. So this place is a name. It places, here's a, a, a woman named Emily who's associated with Morgan. And uh, she is a free woman, which, which uh, is consistent with the mulatto reference in Baller's diary. And she now and it indicates that she came from New York, or at least was coming from Texas from New York with James Morgan. And then we have the final document, the second document that shed some additional light. Now this document is, comes from uh, the William Philpott collection. This, this document was uh, collected by a famous collector and uh, he was not the least bit interested or had any knowledge of Emily West or James Morgan or uh, the entire Texas Revolution, uh, except for the fact that he liked to collect autographs. And he bought a number of papers uh, with James Morgan, primarily because he wanted James Morgan's autograph. A lot of people like to collect famous autographs. <clears throat> and this uh, document appeared in a collection that was uh, pledged as a collateral to a bank that I happen to be the, loan, the, uh, the uh, lawyer for the bank at the time, and uh, went through these documents in 1991 and found this, and could not believe it when I found it, but nonetheless, it was there. And uh, in 1995, uh, it became public, so to speak, and, and people have been talking about it since then. Uh, and fortunately, today, uh, we're going to actually see that document here and uh, have a presentation at lunch, because only last year, 
did that document go from the bank to the University of Texas at Arlington, where it now can be studied along with the other documents. But what this document is is an employment contract. It's dated October 1835 in New York and states that Emily D. West of New Haven, Connecticut, binds herself to go out in Morgan's vessel to Texas and there work for Morgan at any kind of housework she said West is qualified to do and to industrial, industriously pursue the same for 12 months for $100 per year. Now, it doesn't say anything about her race, but there's an interesting clue in the sense that you have a signature, counter signature by a man named Simeon S. Jocelyn, who is a very famous white preacher of a black uh, uh, church in New Haven, Connecticut. And <clears throat> now what's the context of this document? Um, it, it was not found by itself. It was found with several other employment contracts at the same time, also dated New York, October 1836. And Morgan was a real estate speculator. Uh, and he got his money from New York financers. And uh, he bought Clopper's Point, which became New Washington in late 1834. And in 1835, he went back to New York to, to raise more money. He actually raised $60,000, which is a lot of money in those days. Uh, and he used the money to buy two schooners. He bought a large amount of supplies and provisions. And he hired 14 workers, of which we now have six of their employment contracts. And he, he took all these, these were all fairly skilled workers, most of them were, and brought them back to Texas only for a short period of time, although as it turned out, many of the others who are, are listed on the contract stayed in Texas. Many of them fought in the Texas Revolution. Some received land. Uh, many of them filed claims records. <clears throat> so we know that these uh, people existed. And uh, what's interesting about this employment contract is it corroborates the fact that uh, uh, the passport record, which is why Emily West was going back to New York in 1837 when that passport record was filed, because her term of employment was up. And Texas, frankly, was no place for a free woman of color in 1836. Uh, <clears throat> so it really did, did not present many opportunities for her to, uh, to live in Texas. So this, this is the universe of the evidence so far. Uh, hopefully more will be discovered, but you have Ballard's diary, you have the passport record, and you have this employment contract, and that's it. So the issue is not whether there is evidence of Emily being in the tent with Santa Ana. I think that there is evidence. The question is whether that evidence is credible, credible enough to be believable. And, and could there be another spin to the story? And it could very well be that she was in Santa Ana's tent, but maybe not right at the moment of the battle. Maybe it was earlier in the day. Uh, <clears throat> and, and maybe the fact that it was earlier in the day uh, might have somehow impacted Santa Ana's operations. Now, Santa Ana did say in his account that he was asleep at the time the battle started. In one of his accounts, he said he was asleep under the shade of some trees. And that tends to discount the fact that, well, why wasn't he in his tent? Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the few surviving Mexican accounts don't talk about this. Uh, and as I said, no Texan account talks about this other than the fact that Ballard references this letter of Sam Houston. <clears throat> So that's the story. Uh, many, there are many unknowns about this, uh, but, what's, what is, uh, but, the, uh, uh, but what is uh, fascinating about this story is how it's become a cause celebre in the 20th century. And that's because, <clears throat> here, here's a close up of the signatures. And that's because uh, when Ballard's diary was published in 1956, it became a very juicy story. Uh, Frank Tolbert of the Dallas Morning News uh, published his Day of San Jacinto in 1959 and as probably one of the first to actually weave this into a narrative of the battle. Uh, he says that uh, when Santa Ana reached Morgan's plantation, he shared Almonte's interest in Colonel Morgan's belongings, but His Excellency's attention took a less practical direction. Among Morgan's servants who were still working there, the observant president noticed a decorative long-haired mulatto girl. Her name was Emily and she was said to be a very comely Latin-looking woman of about 20. So he, he made a lot of that up, uh, and, uh, but it started, it started the story. Yes, I've only got a few more minutes. Uh, and incidentally, he won the Summerfield Roberts Award in 1960 for this book. <laughs> then he, he comes out in the informal history of Texas, and this is the first time that he actually elaborates even further. And he says, and what became of Emily? She lived to tell her story to her master, Colonel Morgan, and to inspire a wonderful song. Musical historians seem to agree that the folk song, The Yellow Rose of Texas, was inspired by a good-looking mulatto slave girl, and in one of the original lyrics, 
not the ones popularized <clears throat> by Mitch Miller. The girl of the song is called Emily, the maid of Morgan's Point. Colonel Morgan bought Santa Ana's tent after the battle. He sent it to a friend in the United States with this explanation. <clears throat> this was the den of the tiger, which once echoed to the cries of helpless womankind. And of course, no such letter was ever written. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, here he is right there, Frank Tolbert. Uh, Martha Ann Turner, who bought all of Tolbert's uh, thoughts, hook, line, and sinker, wrote this book in 1976 and claimed that the story has been suppressed by historians because historians are male and they don't want to live up to the fact that a woman won the Battle of San Jacinto. <laughs> <clears throat> and that was 26 years ago, and the legend the story is still going on today. So my time is out. Uh, but the point is, is that, uh, you know, with the work that uh, Jim Chris and Jim Lutzwater have been doing, uh, and now with this uh, collection that's now available at UTA, we now have another opportunity to really re-examine this story, and maybe we'll have some more uh, good evidence come out from all of this. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for coming today. Hidden deeply within Jeff's comments was a clue to our next speakers, uh, the people I called a moment ago, the wonderful Wall Ravens. And you can read about the books they've published and the and the uh, the exploits that they have accomplished in your program. What was that hidden clue? That clue that Jeff mentioned about you know some of these Texans had muskets, but. There are a couple of references to uh, a, uh, a couple of hundred of those muskets that had bayonets. And that's why the title of the paper that the Wall Ravens are about to give you, and we're not going to make them do a two-step to come up here back and forth. This is a joint effort, so they're going to share the microphone. And you might just tap it to make sure it's, yeah. Is it working? Uh, OK. See. Yeah. Um, uh, they're, going, they're going to talk about uh, a really interesting aspect of the Texas Revolution that doesn't get as much attention as it should. And both they and then Ed Miller later in the day are going to be talking about it. And that is the role of the United States, specifically the politicians and army officers of the United States uh, in getting assistance to the people who were fighting the Texas Revolution. Um, I wrote a review a, a couple of months ago, a few months ago, of a really remarkable book by Bruce Winders, the historian and curator of the Alamo, a book that I would recommend to all of you, which plays into this idea of the fact that the United States was very much interested in Texas, as we've seen. Uh, he called his book A Crisis in the Southwest, I call my review of his book The 30 Years' War for Texas uh, because uh, that's what he describes, that, that uh, <clears throat> conflict between what became Mexico and what was the United States over Texas lasted a very long time. Um, and this is one chapter in it, but it's a very important chapter. Uh, and it's one which, as I say, gets uh, less attention than it should. Uh, the Magnificent Barbarians, a book published by uh, the Wall Ravens in 1993, was brought to my attention by a mutual friend who said, look at this chapter. And that chapter has been recently updated and published in the quarterly of the Texas, uh, the Southwestern Historical Quarterly by the Texas State Historical Association. What they're talking about is the Sabine Chute. Reminds me of the old fire escape slide on the Clay County Courthouse, which has now been taken down. Uh, real, real shame. We used to go up that chute and down that chute. Uh, you couldn't come down the fire escape unless you made that hard climb up first. 
Uh, they're going to talk about the Sabine Chute, that supposedly escape route for the runaway scrape in the Texas Revolution over the Sabine and into the safety of the United States. And they're going to talk about the people who may have been going the other way. It, it's, a, it's a real honor uh, as journalists to uh, be associated with and working with real historians. Uh, we primarily have been journalists, and sometimes uh, we have to work a little extra to get recognition as historians. Uh, Sam Houston. Uh, I'd like to wonder how he would fare today if he had to face today's media. He wouldn't have time for many battles, and he'd have a thousand investigations going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we are aware that historians differ in their evaluation of Houston, his very character of the man, the role of Sam, at San Jacinto, his place in history. Houston has always been a lightning rod, stirring up bitter arguments as to his motives and actions. It is not our intention to take sides in this controversy. During his lifetime, Houston made many friends and many enemies who viciously attacked him. The seeds they planted, to continue, they continued to sprout. One friend who was, had been a friend, became a better enemy, was Dr. Anson Jones, the last president of the Republic. Strangely enough, Houston and Jones were brother Masons. Jones was master of the Texas First Masonic Lodge, formed in February 1836. Houston was a member of that same lodge also of Cumberland Masonic Lodge, number eight in Nashville, Tennessee, the lodge of which Andrew Jackson was also a member. Houston was a close friend and political ally of Jackson, and Jones saw a conspiracy between the two to start a war between the United States and Mexico. Don't expect to hear that we have proof of such a conspiracy. Jackson didn't leave any smoking guns lying around. He didn't need a Carl Rove to keep his muzzle, uh, 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 a muzzle on the press. He sent personal emissaries himself and often gave instructions for the messages to be burned. So what he did and what he said is subject to supposition, but some of it is most tantalizing. In 1849, John uh, Anson Jones wrote, in my memoranda of 1839, April 2nd, a note, of converse, a, no, a note with a conversation with Mr. J.W. is actually J.H. Houston of Washington, D.C., an intimate and confidential friend of General Houston and <coughs> uh, Jackson, in which he informed me that General Jackson agreed to claim the Natchez as the true Sabine as a boundary between the United States and Mexico under the Treaty of 1819 with Spain and that he would defend and fight on that line. The retreat of General Houston in 1836 <clears throat> was therefore doubtless with a view to the understanding and to place his army behind that line, Jones said. How could Jackson claim the Natchez was the border? The adams on East Treaty of 1819 had relinquished Spain's claim to Florida and set the boundary between the United States and the Spanish territory of Mexico at the Sabine River. General Edmund, T. Edmund P. Gaines, who arrived early in April to command the United States forces at Fort Jessup, Louisiana, explained that the president considered the border to be Lake Sabine Lake and all streams flowing into it. That included the Natchez, which twists and turns a few miles west of Nacogdoches. This claim would have served to justify a United States attack on any armed intruders crossing it. Jones wrote that Houston's retreat to the country between the Sabine and Natchez and the pursuit of Santana and his crossing of the latter stream would have considered and been considered an invasion of the territory of the United States by their president and by the Zachary Taylor of that day, General Jank Gaines, a conflict would have ensued between some of his troops and those of Santana. Blood would have been spilled upon disputed American ground and war commenced an act of Mexico. Then General, quote, uh, Jones, then <clears throat> General Jackson would have accomplished what Mr. President James K. Pope subsequently did. General Gaines would have been the second Cortez instead of General Winfield Scott, 
and the Treaty of Hidalgo would have been signed in 1838 instead of 1848, and there would have been no Republic of Texas. <clears throat> Jones also wrote that Houston did not intend to bite all, at all if he could help it, but to retreat to the natures and obtain some bloodless liquor. And Joan, uh, Jones said he told me himself at Gross's just one week before. In fact, in 1845 speech, Houston admitted to such a plan. He said, quote, Death Smith, having returned from a scout, reported it to the enemy advancing. I then determined to retreat to get as near Andrew Jackson and the old flag as I could. One prevailing theory is that Texans started a war with Mexico and that Mexico war followed because of Southern efforts to extend slavery. Whatever the truth of that assertion, it is also true that Jackson also and others wanted California and considered Texas the key to obtaining it. Jackson's predecessor, John Quincy Adams, had sent Joel Poinsett to Mexico in a futile effort to buy Texas. Jackson sent an even more inept, inept in negotiator, Anthony Butler, to continue the effort. On August 5, 1835, U.S. Secretary John Forsyth sent Butler a message on Jackson's behalf, expressing the desire to expand the negotiations with an eye to acquiring San Francisco for use by the American whaling vessels. Butler was in, instructed to try to try, uh, try to obtain this boundary, beginning at the Gulf of Mexico, proceeding along the eastern bank of Rio Bravo to the 37th parallel latitude, thence to, along that parallel to the Pacific. The correspondence of American military and political officials of the period couched in diplomatic niceties, ambiguous, but one letter especially deserves attention. It was written by Secretary of War uh, Lewis Cash to General Gaines on April 25th, 1836, after the battle had been fought, but before word of Houston's victory had reached Washington. While it disclaimed any desire to take territory from the Mexicans, it authorized Gaines to take a position, quote, on either side of the imaginary boundary line, as may be best for your defensive operations. You will, however, under no circumstances advance no, uh, no further than old Nacogdoches, which is within the bounds of the United States, which is a wild claim. <coughs> it went on to say that such a position would not be exer exercised unless it was necessary to defend the security of the frontier. However, since Nacogdoches is west of the Sabine, such an adversary advanced by gains would surely have provoked a military response from Santana, in other words, a war with the United States and Mexico. At one point, it is clear that Jackson's desire to extend, ob obtain California is not merely for the expansion purposes, but to get the votes of the Eastern whaling interest. Jackson wrote, uh, <clears throat> Jones wrote that Jackson was convinced that Texas would ultimately revert to the U.S., but California was not so situated. And, and for a foothold there, General uh, Jackson would have paid liberal but he would have engaged in the war with Mexico for the same purpose if the pretext could have been found for, for commencing it. Whether or not Jackson and Houston were scheming to start such a war, evidence indicates that U.S. troops, while Jackson was commander-in-chief, actually played an important part in the battle that won the Texas independence. One key is the muskets and the bayonets in the hands of regular troops. Although information concerning them is sketchy and contradictory, military records tell the story, but more about that in a minute. Dr. Eugene Barker, in reviewing the his Heroes of San Jacinto by Sam Houston Dixon and Lewis Wilkes Kemp, said that the book sheds a light on the antiquarian, antiquarian historical <coughs> problem of some importance. It used to be said, and probably was believed by some historians, that 200 soldiers of the United States Army fought at San Jacinto. Quote, if one knew when each of the San Jacinto veterans entered Texas, when enlisted, and how long they served, and how long he remained in Texas after the battle, one would be in a position to deny or verify this ancient assertion with a fair degree of certainty. The book does not give all the information necessary for a determination of the question but that it, gives, it is given tends to disprove the assertion. Although Dr. Baker is believed otherwise, evidence seems to substantiate the ancient claim. 
As Santana advanced across Texas in the winter of 1836, the route of tariff of those fleeing to the Sabine River of the United States was called the Sabine Chute. That name could have well applied to the stream of volunteers and soldiers coming the other way. We became interested in this question while working on the Magnificent Barbarians. In our research, we came across the incredible story of John Walker Baylor, probably the only man to serve in every major battle in the Texas Revolution. The son of an army doctor who was a friend of both Sam Houston and Andrew Jackson, Baylor was admitted to West Point in 1832 when he was 17 years old. He got in all kinds of trouble at the academy. He was expelled for fighting, but President Jackson overruled the court's martial and had him reinstated. He was eventually dismissed for failing French. <laughs> he then took medical training on his, from his father. His father died and he came to Texas in the fall of 1835. He took part in the initial capture of Goliad, the Battle of Conception, the siege and storming of Bear, and he was a signer of the Goliad Declaration of Independence and went to the Alamo with either James Bowie or Philip Dimmitt and left as a courier to Fannin. He escaped death at Goliad as a member of Colonel A.C. Horton's cavalry, which was cut off from the enemy. He then joined Houston's army and drilled some of the reluctant militia. He was slightly wounded at San Jacinto and was one of the horse marines who captured three American ships carrying supplies to the Mexican army at Copano. His wound became affected and he died shortly after returning to his uncle's home in Alabama, <coughs> an unreported casualty of the battle. <coughs> his, uncle, his uncle came to Texas to claim the land that he was due for, <coughs> for his brothers and sisters. He stayed on as a judge who helped write the Constitution and the Articles of Annexation. That uncle was R.E.B. Baylor, one of the founders of Baylor University. <coughs> While tracing the land grants due Baylor in Thomas Lloyd Miller's Bounty and Donation Land Grants, we noticed that Daniel O'Driscoll was, a, was due a head right for a third of a league of land in Victoria County, a bounty of 1,200 acres in Marion County, 400 acres in King County, and 640-acre donation in Refugio for his service in San Jacinto. And also, this was puzzling because he was... Uh, listed as a colonist in the power of Hewittson Irish colony. However, Driscoll's name does not appear in, in the colony's grant papers. Apparently his name was added later to that list. As we were researching these lists, we traveled to Washington and visited the National Archives. There we found the service record of Daniel O. Driscoll. This is also listed as Daniel O. Driscoll. He was an Irish immigrant who had deserted from Company F, 3rd Infantry Regiment, stationed at Fort Jessup. He and five others deserted on Christmas Day, 1835. Driscoll's descendants, of course, became wealthy landowners, and his granddaughter, Clara, is known as the savior of the Alamo. Daniel's death was not as glamorous as that of Baylor. He ran at Refurio Tavern that was a popular political gathering place, and he died when his best friend hit him in the head with a stick as they celebrated July the 4th. <laughs> We found his name and we wondered if there were any other similar deserter. So we bought microfilms from the uh, U.S. 3rd, 6th, 4th, and 7th infantry rosters and the returns from the National Archives and typed them into a database and checked the information against the Texas rosters of the Revolution and Miller's book. We discovered that seven other members of Company E, 3rd Infantry, deserted that same day. Driscoll and two others became sergeants in Miller's company. After serving in the Texas Army, Driscoll was discharged as a lieutenant. The rosters and returns were, uh, showed the, the uh, monthly operation records, the company rosters, the recruit, sick, death reports, and discharges and desertions. They indicate that at least 97 men trained by the U.S. Army were under arms in Texas on or before April 21st, 1836. Possibly four of them died at the Goliad and three at the Alamo and a check of rosters and returns from other U.S. frontier units might show similar results. We found names similar or identical to those some, to some 50 nominal deserters and 32 men who had been honorably discharged, some of them two or three years previously, 
on the Texas rosters before t uh, April 21st. An additional 15 names appear on both U.S. and Texan rosters at the same time as the Battle of San Jacinto, indicating that these soldiers could have remained in their U.S. Army roles while they were actually in Texas fighting a war. An additional 56 U.S. names appear on Texan rules shortly after the battle, indicating that at least 150 U.S. soldiers served in Texas during that period of the Revolution. These soldiers did not come marching in a mass. They trickled in. Many had deserted in 1834 and a few even earlier. However, the number of desertions per month rose markedly in December of 1835 and January of 36. Most came from the third station at Fort Jessup, some 35 miles from the Sabine River. Deserters going to Texas were not detained, while those going to Baton Rouge or New Orleans were ended up in the guardhouse, <laughs> which is an indication. <laughs> Others came from the uh, six, which was brought down from Jefferson Barracks. A few came from the fourth at Baton Rouge, and some come from the seventh at Fort Tosin. Just how many deserters uh, were with the Texas Army will never be known. Names on the records indicate Smith, Jones, Brown, Johnson, and other very common names that you couldn't really identify uh, between the two. Some of the soldiers were known only by initials. Company clerks spell names phonetically, and those days people weren't particular about spellings. Some even carried the spellings, mis uh, carried the spellings of their own names uh, changed uh, from time to time. Furthermore, accounts of list men and units escorting the panic-stricken civilians to the border to defend Galveston or to other positions. And what most significant of all, the U.S. 3rd Regiment, Company D, for 1936 is missing from the regiment, so there could have been quite a few more. It is more than a probability that many of the Texas regulars at San Jacinto were, in fact, United States soldiers in United States Army uniforms carrying United States government issue muskets powder and lead. Their most distinguishing mark was their GI bayonets. The two key words in the statement are regulars and bayonets. Texas did not have a large number of regular soldiers in March 1836. A special committee reported, this is in March, just ahead of it. A special committee reported that the regular army, there appears to be 60 privates. Although they did not, they did not know it, 30 of these were dead with Travis and Alamo Another 30 were serving with Fannin and probably died at Goliad. Fannin had pr proposed that West Pointers be recruited to train Texas troops. Travis agreed. He had to, he has been the top ex exponent of regular troops, uh, but found recruiting them frustrating. The government offered a $25 bonus at 800, $800 acres as an enlistment inducement and a promise of uniforms, horses, and equipment, but there were few takers. Independent frontiersmen were reluctant to subject themselves to rules and military discipline. Also, many of the volunteers refused to be formed into companies because they wished to be able to go home and protect their families if circumstances required it, as they, as they did, indeed. Travis managed to recruit 40 men to his troop before it set out for the Alamo. On the trail, 10 of them deserted, taking horses and equipment with them. Five would fight at San Jacinto including Alfonso Steele, who was severely wounded and left to be the last survivor of the battle. So, turn this over to my partner. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Well, Travis gained a few more regulars with Juan Seguin's troop. Most of the Army was composed of raw volunteers. The Mobile and New Orleans Grays might have qualified as regulars, but they fell at Goliad and with Travis at the Alamo. As Houston retreated northward, his army grew until news of the Goliad massacre arrived and many colonists left to protect their families. Along the muddy trek to Harrisburg, he began once again to pick up recruits. Captain Henry Teal added 40 regulars. Among them were men who bought their own arms and needed no clothing allotment, the men from the U.S. Army outposts across the Sabine. In Day of San Jacinto, Frank X. Talbert said that Quote, a number of regulars wore parts of United States Army uniforms disguised with buckskin accessories. They were garrison troops from Louisiana who'd been allowed to, quote, desert 
for a short fighting vacation with the Texas rebels. Uh, we, we've decided that it, and it uh, might have been a good idea for him to substitute volunteer for dessert because it has a better connotation. But uh, anyway, one early San Jacinto victim was Private Owen J. Trask. Talbert said he was a U.S. officer on leave to serve as a private in the Texas Army. He was mortally wounded on April 20th when the Texas Cavalry skirmished with Mexicans. We could not find him on West Point rosters, but there was an early graduate named Thomas S. Trask. When the next day's battle began, Colonel Henry Millard's fully equipped regulars supported the artillery to the right of the center of the Texas line. The volunteers were ordered to fire some 100 yards from the Mexican lines, but Houston ordered the regulars to fire about 30 yards from the enemy. Such a short range is another indication of U.S. service, as in 1834-36, the United States was equipping its soldiers with variations of the Model 1816 flintlock musket, which had a much shorter range than the rifles most of the volunteers carried. However, the regulars could reload faster and more efficiently than the volunteers. As the Mexican troops seemed to be reorganizing, the volunteers were ordered to kneel and fire. The salvo completed the route. When told to halt at the breastworks, the more disciplined regulars followed orders, standing ready to respond if Mexican reinforcements arrived. They offered the only semblance of stability when the volunteers, screaming for revenge for the Alamo and Goliad massacres, became uncontrollable in their blood lust. Earlier in the spring of 1836, Brazos River merchant Francis Smith was in Cincinnati seeking treatment for cancer. After he learned that his condition was hopeless, he decided to return to Texas. The ladies of the city asked him to take the famous twin sisters with him. He did, and then died shortly after uh, he delivered them. As Houston retreated before the advancing Santa Ana, 30 men, including officers, pushed and shoved the newly alived weapons, six-pounders, through the mud and across flooded ravines. When the battle finally came, they were fired with devastating effect, even though there had been no time for practice shots. Thanks to experience in the U.S. Army, the artillery men didn't need much practice. U.S. Army infantry regiments had artillery trains equip equipped with six-pound cannon. The first lieutenant of Houston's artillery corps was William Shaler Stilwell, an 1827 graduate of the United States Military Academy. Seven privates from the regulars were transferred to, quote, assist the artillery corps. One of them, Private Ellis Benson, had been discharged from Company G of the 3rd U.S. Infantry, February the 28th, 1834. Others, among the others, were at least three 3rd Infantry deserters, Private Michael Campbell, George Cumberland, and Ira Milliman. Milliman deserted from Company H on December the 18th, 1835. George Cumberland from Company E on December the 25th, and Michael Campbell from Company B on January the 4th, 1836. Stilwell was not the only West Pointer among the Texans. After his graduation, Brevet Lieutenant Hugh McLeod, the last man in the West Point class of 1835, was assigned to Company B of the 3rd U.S. Regiment. On the way to Fort Jessup, he stopped at Macon, Georgia on November the 12th, 1835, as the Georgia Battalion was preparing to leave for Texas. He promised to resign his commission and embark as a volunteer. He served as temporary commander of Company B, U.S. 3rd Infantry, at Fort Jessup until March the 7th, 1836, when he asked for a 10-day leave. It was granted, but he was later listed as absent without official leave through July when his resignation was accepted. During the runaway scrape, McLeod, with 30 men, garrisoned the fort at Nacogdoches. Mrs. Thomas Rusk joined the flight with her young sons, but she didn't panic. She advised others to be calm for this is a quote from her. As long as the brave McLeod or one of his men is living, we have nothing to fear. 
No record tells whether the men McLeod commanded at Nacogdoches were Texas volunteers or the 30-man company he had commanded in the U.S. Army. In addition to Walker Baylor, Fannin, Stilwell, and McLeod, Richard L. Stockton, who died in the Alamo, had attended West Point, and had, as had James Hazard Perry, the aide on Houston staff. And during the battle, Houston carried a sword he had received as a gift from Captain Joseph Bonnell, also an Academy graduate and a U.S. officer from Fort Jessup. The other key word in this study, apart from regulars, is bayonet. The number of Texan bayonets at San Jacinto is both confusing and contradictory, all the way from none to 200. The bayonet was a trademark of regular troops, a fact that Sam Houston did not wish to advertise. It was later reported that before the San Jacinto assault, Secretary of War Thomas Rusk advised against an assault across an open field, quote, without bayonets. Ever the politician, Houston wrote in an official report, the conflict in the breastwork lasted but a few minutes. Many of the troops encountered hand to hand and not having the advantage of bayonets on our side, our riflemen used the pieces as war clubs, breaking many off at the breach. In spite of these statements, there is primary evidence that the Texians had bayonets and used them. We were ordered to charge with our bayonets, William C. Swearingen, second sergeant in Amasa Turner's regular Company B, wrote to his brother in Kentucky. The enemy gave way except about 60 men around the cannon. They were protected by a breastwork of corn sacks, salt, barrels of meat, and boxes of canister shot. They fell by the bayonet and swam in one mangle heap from that time until they reached the bayou. bayou. The regulars, missing out on the bloodbath and with orders to guard the campsite against possible Mexican reinforcements, amused themselves by thrusting their bayonets through any wounded or stragglers. Alfonso Steele, severely wounded at the outset of the battle, said, I was so blind I could hardly see anything, and I sat down on a dead Mexican. Some regulars who had stayed at the Mexican breastworks came sticking their bayonets through wounded Mexicans, and one of them had his bayonet drawn to stick through me when Tom Green, who belonged to the infantry, stopped him. Talbert tells how Texas regulars were also trying to use their bayonets on two Mexican drummer boys. Dr. Robert Kemp Goodlow was trying to protect them, but they might have died had not Colonel Sidney Sherman come by and told the boys to follow him. E.F. Sparks had a similar experience when a woman jumped out of the bulrushes. A regular was threatening to kill her with his bayonet. I told him if he killed her, I would kill him. He asked if I was in earnest. I said I was. Then three other women came running to us, crying and begging that I would protect them too. Captain Juan Seguin and his men came by, and Sparks left the women in their care. A Mexican officer's account also cites the use of bayonets. In describing the cruelty of his captors after the battle, Captain Pedro Delgado, commander of the Mexican artillery, said, these savages struck with their bayonets our wounded soldiers lying on the way. Others following them consummated the sacrifice with a musket or pistol shot. Another intriguing statement is found in this account of a discussion during the April 21st Council of War Houston called before the assault. Two junior officers favored attack, but four seniors objected that it was un un an unheard of thing for raw soldiers with only 200 bayonets without cover of artillery to cross an open prairie to charge a disciplined army. Dr. Terence Berge, a professor of military history at Texas A&M University, Kingsville, said the bayonets and the regular's fast, accurate fire, along with the artillery handled by experienced soldiers, probably contributed to the early panic and slaughter of so many of Santana's soldiers. Colonel Delgado confirmed that opinion. Describing the skirmish on April the 20th, he wrote, as soon as the enemy saw our artillery and stores unprotected, he paid them special attention. 
He established his cannon in such manner as to disable our gun and to support an attack should it take place. The first shot shattered the caisson on the limber. Another scattered about our ordnance boxes. Another, again, killed two fine mules. The Texian victory at San Jacinto stimulated a desire for freedom and land among the troops and a chance to fight. When General Gaines ordered an armed force into Nacogdoches in late July of 1836, members of the 3rd, 4th, and 6th regiments took advantage of new opportunities to desert. Gaines became alarmed at the scope of the defections and asked Houston to return them. Historian William J. later quoted this passage from the Pensacola Gazette of that period. About the middle of last month, General Gaines sent an officer of the United States Army into Texas to reclaim some deserters. He found them already enlisted in the Texas service to the number of 200. They still wore the uniform of our Army, but refused, of course, to return. It was understandable that they would not want to return, for they were promised land for their service in Texas. Many were immigrants to whom land ownership had been only a dream. Furthermore, the United States Army offered no life of leisure for enlisted men. They were often worked like galley slaves, building roads and performing manual labor. <clears throat> Discipline was harsh and punishment severe. Floggings with mule whips were common. Samuel Lee Chamberlain told of being swung from a limb by his thumbs while his toes <coughs> barely touched the ground for insubordination during the Mexican War. If they were allowed to, quote, desert, end quote, in order to fight with the Texas rebels, it is understandable that many took advantage of the offer. Whichever side you take on the question of the Natchez conspiracy, you can find evidence to support it. On April 23, 1836, before the results of the San Jacinto battle were known in the United States, Samuel Swartwout, who, quote, possessed both the ear and confidence of President Jackson, had written to James Morgan, a Texas friend and business associate, already do I suspect that General Gaines is in possession of Nacogdoches. However, ardent Houston biographer Marquis James said, Another factor in Houston's favor was the Sabine retreat story. Houston had never intended to fall back to the Sabine, but the report was so persistently circulated and never denied that the Mexicans included it in their strategic calculation. There is, however, another side to the story of U.S.-Mexican relations. In a December 19, 1835 letter to President Jackson, Anthony Butler described this incident. On a recent occasion, the French and British ministers waited upon Santa Ana on some joint application. There was an audience beside these ministers, some eight or ten other gentlemen. Santa Ana, as usual, very soon began to speak of the affairs of Texas, and as a consequence, introduced the U states. He spoke of our desire to possess that country, declared his full knowledge that we had instigated and were supporting the revolt, and that he would in due season chastise for us. Butler said <coughs> that he was told that Santa Ana said he understood, quote, that General Jackson sets up a claim to pass the Sabine, and that in running the division line, hopes to acquire the country as far as the Natchez. Santa Ana then turned to a gentleman present and said, sir, I mean to run that line at the mouth of my cannon, and after the line is established, if the nation will only give me the means, only afford me the necessary supply of money, I will march to the capital. I will lay Washington City in ashes, as it has already been once done. At that point, Butler wrote, Santa Anna again turned and bowed to the British minister in a pointed reference to the events of the War of 1812. This statement, of course, shows that Santa Anna was aware of a possible plan to draw him into a conflict with the United States. The fact that Santa Ana understood Jackson's position on the Neches casts a new light on the Battle of San Jacinto. The Mexican forces enjoyed an overwhelming numerical superiority over the Texans. Santa Ana would not have hesitated to take on any U.S. force that crossed the Sabine. His fatal error came when he split his army and dashed ahead of the main force in a futile effort to capture the leaders of the Texas government, especially the 
to him traitorous vice president, Lorenzo de Zavala. Mexican General Vicente Filosola wrote that in spreading his forces, Santa Ana, quote, placed victory in the hands of a disheartened enemy, one who had already decided to abandon the country. In defense of his actions, Santa Ana wrote, since the direction that Houston had taken showed that he was withdrawing across the Trinity River, and so that there should remain no one to fire a shot from the Rio Grande to the Sabine, it was necessary not just to worry the rear guard, but to cut off his retreat and defeat him. The Texian attack caught an overconfident Santa Ana totally unprepared on April the 21st because he counted on Houston's intent to retreat across the Neches and obtain support from the waiting Americans. As to whether his men forced a reluctant Houston to turn his march south to San Jacinto instead of east toward the Sabine, or whether the wily general made the decision himself, the question will probably never be resolved. However, the, presidents of US, the presence of U.S. soldiers at the Battle of San Jacinto shows that the role of the United States in the Texas Revolution has been greatly underestimated, and a look at the U.S. diplomacy of the period shows that Although the term was not used until years later, manifest destiny was a work in progress from the early days of the American Republic. The victory of Sam Houston and his forces on the San Jacinto battlefield was the key to the success of that manifest destiny. to Bill and Marjorie Walraven and, and Jeff Dunn's uh, punctuality in stopping their lectures on time. My, my students wish that I could do that. Uh, we have uh, four or five minutes uh, for uh, some questions that you might have. I have a question for them that I don't want them to answer now, but to think about uh, for our larger and longer question and answer session later in the afternoon. And that's the question about sources. Uh, for, uh, for, for Jeff, uh, Houston's alleged promise to Sherman uh, to send Millard's men in support. Who says so besides Sherman? Uh, the Council of War. I think there are probably discrepancies in the sources on what exactly was said in the Council of War at San Jacinto. Uh, and I would want Jeff to say something about that. And then, of course, also you've seen the conflicting versions of who said charge and why. Uh, it may be that I'll have to emulate one of those stories about Sam Houston when it gets time for lunch. Uh, and, uh, and some of you may be getting up to go by the time I tell, give you permission. Uh, that's, that's certainly what some people have claimed, that when Houston was wondering whether to yell charge, and ask Rusk or someone like that whether he ought to, uh, ought to issue that order, he says, well, you might as well because there they go. Uh, so I want, <clears throat> I, w I, I would like, uh, I would like uh, later in the afternoon for some of these discrepancies and possible discrepancies in sources uh, to be addressed uh, after they've had a chance to think about that. It's a little unfair to say, tell me your source off the top of your head because I have a few uh, moments where I can't think of my wife's name. We have a question right here. I'd like them to discuss their opinion of the involvement of the twin sisters. Similar type question, you may want to address it later. But uh, it seems that it had a gr much greater importance than we give it to um, uh, Let's just take the two or three minutes we have left and let each of you uh, say just how important in the final outcome at San Jacinto uh, I think all of them have alluded to this, uh, were the twin sisters, which came obviously from the United States in the nick of time. I think Delgado. Uh, to, uh, uh, use the mic to a, a greater extent. Though. I think Delgado illustrated as much as anything because uh, he was an artilleryman and he was impressed with the accuracy of the thing and it, it disabled their cannon. Bill, would you suggest that the accuracy of that artillery crew had anything to do with those United States troops who were manning the uh, artillery? Uh, they, they moved them from one to the other units after they were in. They moved them from the other units after they were already situated uh, because 
they were in artillery when they moved them over uh, to uh, the, the, uh, the artillery segment. Yeah, Jeff, did you need the mic? No, I think the Twin Sisters did have an effect. And as I mentioned before, a lot of it was just the noise uh, created a lot of fright. Um, and uh, they had the effect of throwing off this shrapnel, uh, which, which uh, had the effect of uh, destroying a lot of the breastworks. There's accounts of the breastworks being destroyed or parts of it being destroyed because of that. Th these were field pieces. And there were uh, other cannons laying around lower Gulf Coast at the time, but they were not if I can get this so I don't get the feedback. So they uh, uh, don't, ha they were, but those were uh, more like naval guns and used in forts and things of that sort. Uh, the field pieces had caissons and uh, were shipped down through New Orleans and uh, uh, the, the, ch the chain of possession is, uh, indicates that they went to Brazoria first and then around to, to Galveston to New Washington up to Harrisburg. Um, but uh, they were not very big, and, and the accounts differ as to whether they were four-pounders or six-pounders, and that was determined by the, by the weight of the ball that you used to put in the cannon. But they really didn't have any balls so, to, to use, round balls, so they, they cut up shrapnel and put those in, in bags and used that as the, as the ammunition. Uh, but you have uh, uh, Hockley, who commanded the artillery, on, San, on, on uh, April 21st said there were four pounders, but Houston said there were six pounders. But, but the reality is, is that the circumference is so small uh, that all they really had to go on was just eyesight, probably. Uh, and the Mexican cannon was described as a much bigger cannon uh, as a 12 pounder by uh, Sam Houston, uh, but Santa Ana describes it as a six pounder. So it may have been a much smaller uh, cannon. And incidentally, there are accounts that talk about the Mexican cannon being called the golden standard, uh, but the reality there is it was really called El Vulcan, the volcano. Uh, the golden standard is somewhat of a 20th century uh, uh, name that was applied to it. Although there, there was a, an 1836 account that Lewis Kemp uh, uh, interpreted as golden standard. But if you look at that account, and I could, if you're interested in these cannons, I can give you that citation. Uh, it doesn't look like golden uh, standard to me, so I think that it was more of a 20th century name. So it's interesting to think, is there only three cannon at the entire battle? Uh, but they, uh, but they did have an effect. Uh, the other side tended to to respect the the cannon. Sorry, Jeff. Marjorie, did you want to add anything to that discussion? Um, it's after 11:30. We promised you lunch at 11:30, so charge. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, that's why they were so interesting. Thank you so much.